One year ago, the entire world awaited the fateful outcome as the armies of Nazi Germany lashed out in the counteroffensive in the Ardennes. This was the Battle of the Bulge, the battle that came so dangerously close to crushing Allied hopes for early victory. This was the 11th hour von Rundstedt counterattack on which Germany gambled everything. Smashed Allied equipment littered the road. The year 1944 was dying. The year 1945 was beginning in an atmosphere of doubt and cruel anxiety and cold and hunger and death. Then coming back from the punch in the West, the Yanks and British moved forward to the fighting. They had landed in Normandy. They had slashed their way to Germany's borders. They had absorbed the roughest punishment the Germans could hand out. In Central Europe, the Czechoslovaks and the long enslaved people of the Balkans moved against the common enemy. Now, with air power in the lead, they were started on the last long drive to victory. American forces on the west and south of the bulge carved up elite units of the Wehrmacht. Montgomery's British on the north were immovable. Together, these two mighty allies crushed the final German bid for victory and moved steadily to a meeting with their gallant Russian ally in the east. Berlin, citadel of Nazism, fell. Early in January, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was inaugurated as President of the United States, his fourth successive term. The simple ceremony took place on the White House porch. Almost immediately, the President went to Yalta, conferred with Joseph Stalin and Winston Churchill on final steps to crush the Axis and establish peace. It was the last meeting of the original Big Three. Franklin Roosevelt looked tired and old. In April, a great man was dead. The loss of Franklin Delano Roosevelt was deeply felt by people all around the world. room of the White House, Harry S. Truman was sworn in as president. On the very eve of victory and its disturbing aftermath, his was the heavy duty of carrying on with the leaders of America's allies. 25 days later, on May the 7th, in a little schoolhouse in Reims, France, came the unconditional surrender of Germany. General Alfred Jodl, Nazi chief of staff, signed the document formally ending all German resistance as drawn by the representatives of Russia, Britain, France, and the United States. General Walter Beadle Smith signed for the Supreme Command, and the end of one of history's most massive and most brilliant campaigns brought a moment of well-earned joy to an American soldier named Ike Eisenhower. In the Pacific, in mortal combat against a fanatic foe, the Army, the Marines, and the Navy were driving to a Finnish fight alongside their gallant Chinese and Philippine allies. The Philippines had been won back, so had a score of other vital islands, large and small, including one called Iwo Jima. But the Kamikaze Corps, the Japanese pilots who rode the divine wind to certain suicide and possible devastation of our ships, were taking a heavy toll. Easter Sunday, following the pattern of invasion unleashed a half a hundred times against Japanese bases, U.S. forces assaulted the island of Okinawa. First, the bombardment. Then, from the fleet standing offshore, the landing craft went in. 
the mighty pageant of assault rolled ahead again, this time less than 400 miles from Japan itself. This was the island that the Japanese simply could not afford to lose. For four months, they fought a desperate battle that cost them 90,000 lives. The island was safe in U.S. hands in July. First in a test in the United States, New Mexico desert, then 5,000 miles away at Hiroshima, and then again at Nagasaki, came the world-shaking explosions of the atomic bomb. Her armies defeated wherever they had been met, her navy virtually destroyed, Japan asked for peace. Aboard the USS Missouri in Tokyo Bay, on Sunday, September the 2nd, 1945, the most horrible war in history came to its complete and formal end. Foreign Minister Shigemitsu signed for Japan. Douglas MacArthur, Supreme Commander. General Su Yong Chang signed for China. But the world could not forget or excuse the savage crimes of those who had opened that war, who had deliberately and willfully brought death and suffering to millions. To the innocent tortured civilians of Manila, for example, for these atrocities, Japan's leaders would be held responsible and would stand trial. Yamashita, Japanese commander in the Philippines, has already been sentenced to death. Hideki Tojo, Japanese war premier, faced trial as the year ended. His suicide attempt would not prevent the carrying out of justice. Behind bars were others. Admiral Shimoda, Shigemori Koruda, General Nasaharu Koma and Kingoro Hashimoto, Black Dragon terrorist. Across the earth, the pictorial record which the world had seen of German death camps would not be readily forgotten either. Nazi officials like Joseph Kramer, the Beast of Belsen, have already paid with their lives for the crimes they committed against innocent men, women, and children. Milan, Italy, after two decades of swaggering, the inventor of fascism, Benito Mussolini, lay dead at the hands of the Italian people with his henchman and his mistress. Adolf Hitler, who had survived a bomb planted by one of his own officers in 1944, was presumably alive until the last days of Berlin. By the best evidence, he is now dead. At Nuremberg, the Hitler gang has gone on trial. For the first time, criminal war leaders are being judged by an international court, by mankind. Goering, Hess, von Ribbentrop, and the 17 others, men who had planned world conquest and the death and enslavement of millions, are now tried under law and the law in all nations has rules for dealing with criminals. Men of all the world took hope, peace and decency were assured as the representatives of the United Nations signed the San Francisco Charter. The lessons learned in 1945, if mankind would remember them, could make the world a better place for all men forever. Mm -hmm.